this thing puts a kid into a position where they can't ever learn from mistakes. Mm-hmm. They can continue to do the same thing over and over again. And you can just write it off as, oh, that's that's just the disease. Yeah, that's, that's just a that's part of it, and there's nothing can be done about it. Because well, that kid will you, think that, too. Exactly. And the thing is, if they think they can't fix it, then they won't. Right. And if I they think it, if they think they can't help it, that their bad behavior is just the side effect of whatever condition it is that they have, they will never work to correct it because they think that it can't be done. And it can be. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. There is a new disease that has been diagnosed and that they're coming out and, and talking about some of the different uh, symptoms, and it has to do with our school kids. And so if we have a large portion, a large plurality of our school children being diagnosed with this kind of like ADD or ADHD, it could be something that affects a lot of local schools and the Alabama school system as a whole before too long. And so to discuss this and to talk about some of this, we actually have a special guest in studio with us today. John from Millbrook is actually going to be in studio with us for the remainder of this segment. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's great. This evening. Yes, great to be on. They're calling this a disease. This is a disease. This is. A, I thought a disease was something you catch. Not necessarily. I know that. I, I do know that. Yeah. But they make it sound like it's a regular, like a common cold or something. Right. That is what's going on That's here. That's my point. Yeah. Uh, it's called oppositional defiant disorder. And this is something that the medical community has just recently come out with. It's a behavioral disorder. And I thought that I'd go ahead and just give you a little bit uh, from the Mayo Clinic. They have an overview about it saying that it causes behavioral problems. But sort of getting into it, here's the symptoms. Mm -hmm. It says, sometimes it's difficult to recognize the difference between a strong-willed or emotional child and one with oppositional defiant disorder. I think that we would agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to tell the difference, almost like they're the same thing. They are. Uh, it's normal to exhibit oppositional behavior at certain stages of a child's development. So here they're already kind of hedging their bets when they're giving you the synopsis. And again, this isn't like some fly-by-night source. This is the Mayo Clinic's definition of this thing. And they're saying when they give their introduction, mm -hmm. well, this thing's basically indistinguishable from just a strong-willed child. And then they say in the second sentence here, it's normal to exhibit op oppositional behavior at certain stages of a child's development. Well, if it's normal, why are you diagnosing it as a disease? That, uh, you know, when I, I started talking with people about this, and I've been sharing some information about it because I was completely appalled by it when I heard it. Mm -hmm. Because as a, as a teacher for 27 years and being involved in education all of my adult life, and I was about to say, degree, even still today that you're retired, yeah, you still work with young people. I do. Uh, all the time with our livestock club, and I still I help some kids this week, in fact, as you well know. I can't, when I saw the list and I heard some of the things that they were talking about with this particular, and I call it a malady, maybe it could be called that, I don't know, but I do know this much. When I saw the list, the first thing that popped into my mind was that describes about 80 or 90 percent of the teenage boys that I taught for 27 years, which could add up <laughs> right. to at least 1,500 kids. Uh, in, in my estimation, I don't see, and when a teacher that's taught a long time, that's dealt with teenagers in particular, and, and uh, you know, I don't have much experience with elementary kids except my own. When you see a list like this and you hear, uh, being unusually angry or irritable. Not just boys, girls. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the young people, when they walked into my room, they didn't like being there. Right. They were you know, in school. You, you had to talk them into getting excited about whatever it was you were going to do as soon as they walked well, in the door. Be, and, be careful about bumping the camera. You're making me shake over <laughs> here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll try to do that. I, I'm not accustomed to being on, on camera, but... And I know you're like it, me. You talk with your hands. I yeah, understand I do. that. Uh, but someone frequently losing their temper. I mean, that happened daily with kids. Uh, 
But the problem with that is, is that you had so many of them, and they're acting as if this is something that you don't have any control over. Right. That, and, and, think, and the child doesn't have any control over, and you can't do anything about it. And I beg to differ. I think that's my biggest problem with this whole thing is that usually when they when they come out with some sort of behavioral disorder, you can kind of see it to a certain degree. But by and large, there's going to they make it so broad and they encompass so many traits of so many kids that they're basically doing what's known as a rainbow statement. Sure. Which is they're throwing something out there that is so vague and so broad that it could make almost anybody qualify. Sure. And that's what they want, because you can bet on this. There are going to be dollars tied to it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, They're going to be medicine. And on the education end, this is part of the problem, too. Mm -hmm. It gives you an out. If there's a kid you can't control, you can't do anything with, then here's your out. Because you can't control this disorder that they have. As a result of that, then you're whipped to start with and you can't do anything about it. And And you can also write that one off and say, you know, there's not much I can do about this one. They treat it like some other kind of disease. I can't cure cancer. I can't cure uh, whatever tuberculosis or whatever it may be mm-hmm. that might happen. And, and teachers think about that and they say automatically, well, there's not a lot I can do about it. But here's the problem with this. Across the board, what this is going to do as far as discipline inside the school is going to be one one more step in the wrong direction yeah. across the board in public education, whereas you won't find this in other education. You'll find it in public education only. Mm. You know, they, I mean, they may identify it somewhere else, but I would tend to guess that they'll say, they'll look at it, the the principal, the, the uh, head administrator at a private school will say, that's stupid, we don't have that, which is true. Sure. Uh, of course, they have teenagers that are angry, and they're well, in their developmental stages, and and those kind of things. But but kids change, and they can adapt, and they grow out of a lot of that after their behavior has been channeled in a different direction, and they've been able to do that. But I'll, I'll let you respond. But that's I was irate about it to be honest, because I know what kind well, of problems. Well, maybe you have the you have the disease. That's the problem. Yeah, you maybe so. Easily irritated by this. I'm irritated by this thing because. And I'm not even teaching now, but I can sure. I can guess. Don't think the kids won't find out about this. Well, because they, and they'll use it to their advantage too. It's you can an, rest assured it's another with ex- that it's another excuse to justify behavior and say that it, well, it's not my fault that I'm doing right. X. And so that's the real problem I have with it. Just to to give you a little rundown, that like I said, the the source that I'm using here is the Mayo Clinic. They say that the symptoms would include. Angry and irritable mood, often and easily loses temper, frequently touchy and easily annoyed by others, is often angry and resentful. That's most teenagers. Oh, yeah. Anybody that's been around teenagers would say that's the vast majority of teenagers. Uh, Argumentative and defiant behavior, often argues with adults or people in authority, often actively defies or refuses to comply with adults' requests or rules, often deliberately annoys or upsets people often blames other for his or her mistakes or misbehavior. Mo- I don't even know that this is teenagers. That's a lot of adults. Well, yeah, they grow into that, too. I'll say this. We've gotten to the point now. This is kind of a catch-all because I could justify almost every teenager and put them into one of the categories that they have. Right. For example, we were looking through that list that I just read to you, you would say that, by and large, I was a fairly well-behaved, well-adjusted kid even when I was a teenager. Correct? Oh, absolutely. Like, not to the level I am now, obviously. I'm more mature, I hope, now than yeah. I, when, I, when I was 15. But the point is, I was a pretty even-tempered kid. You were. You would act goofy. Sure. But, I mean, you weren't belligerent. You weren't... But would you say that I often argued with adults and people in authority? No. No. Really? No. I thought that I would. Mm, I remember no. arguing a lot. With who? Well, with you for one. <laughs> what do you mean? Around the house? Sure. Well, about debatable things, but not about what should be done. Does right. that make sense? But, I, but I, my point is I, I did argue with people 
I mean, as far I mean, I can remember arguing with people a lot, including other teachers. I wasn't nasty or cruel or vengeful. No, or I, that's what I'm talking about. But, you but were what never I'm that saying way. is, I did argue, and that's what. Yeah, you. That's the stipulation that's being used here. Often okay, I see what you're with saying. Adults now. or people in authority. I did that. I mm-hmm. did that on a pretty regular basis. Uh, if a teacher was saying something that didn't make sense to me, I argued with them about it. Mm-hmm. Wasn't out of I didn't like them or anything. It was just I'm I'm a by nature, I like to argue, and I, I think that it actually helps people to engage in a, a back and forth to be able to develop their ideas. And see, here's it. Um, uh, defies or refuses to comply with adults' requests or rules. Now, if an adult told me to do something, by and large, I did it. But mm-hmm. as far as the rules, you know, I kind of skirted around the rules a good bit in high school. And so I'm just saying that you could take yeah. even a, a fairly well-adjusted, well-behaved kid, mm-hmm. and because this definition is so incredibly broad, you could even put them into that category, at least on some of the grounds. Okay, this is an act. They're describing a very active kid here. Sure. Uh, verbally, mm-hmm. uh, even physically. Mm-hmm. All right. Here's the problem with it, too. All right, you've got a kid that's withdrawn and shy. Yeah. Then you could put them in the category of having an attention deficit disorder, they're not engaging. There's another category for them. So you have every base covered. You say, well, uh, of course they have uh, learning disabled people. Sure. But then you've also got exceptional people that are incredibly intelligent. And we've all known. My point is this. Mm-hmm. we got a category for everybody. Don't well, tell me we don't because, and, and I heard somebody, and this, they've been talking about this on Kevin's show. Right. I, I sent him a text I heard a about little this. bit of that. Yeah, yeah I, I sent him a text about this. He was blown away. He had no idea that they would even come. And it, I understand because Kevin's 60 years old, 61, something like that. From our generation, and I'm younger than he is, but we couldn't even fathom coming up with something like this. Right. Because we got defiant. As Kevin said on his show, we got our butt whooped. My mama take care of the defiance. That right. would, that wouldn't be a problem. I can get over my defiance. Right. That was the solution. That right was there. the and that was the cure. It, it worked. But, but but what you're talking about too is saying that it's a catch all. Listen to this, and this is again coming from my my source at the Mayo Clinic. Mm-hmm. Um, ODD may lead to problems such as poor school and work performance, antisocial behavior, impulsive control problems substance use disorders, suicide. That is a wide range of Imp- results because it says that when get work, impulsive. Right. But I mean, think about how much that encompasses. Yeah. It literally ranges everywhere from not making good grades to killing yourself. Yeah. That's such a broad uh, range of results that this thing can come into that, for example, even a, a really, broad sweeping definition disease something that's become kind of an umbrella term like cancer there's so many different kinds of cancer it can result in so many different symptoms even it is more direct than that well here's the, I mean, here's that's, that's almost everybody okay we're different in this of course sure. you look at the terms you define things uh you're talking about the overall view of it and that kind of thing mm-hmm. and what's conjured up in my mind are examples right i mean i can think of uh which one of these descriptions here would be given for a dramatic teenage girl that's 14 or 15? Sure. I mean, good grief, because they overstate everything practically. Mm-hmm. They come, this is the worst day in the history of the world. Well, no, it's not. Well, you know, and I they come in saying that. I'm I have to, often compared uh, politicians to teenage girls because with politicians, part of oh. the way that they come in to get elected is they have to act like every single problem is the worst problem the world has ever faced. Oh, yeah, and it's not. Yeah. It's, it's just like with politicians. I say, I heard someone say the other day, this is the worst time and the, the we are more at odds now than we ever have been in the history of this country in 200 and something. I'm saying... Did they forget about the, the Civil, Civil War? The Civil War. Right. The doggone Civil War where over 600,000 people died. Right. We were killing each other. And they say now. That was pretty divided. That's pretty divided. We had different governments. Or like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a few weeks ago saying that uh, global warming is our World War II. Right. And I'm where thinking. Millions of people died. 70 million people died in yeah. World War II. No people have died from global warming. You can't compare those two problems. Oh, they say they have, though, because when a, anytime a hurricane hits, they say, well, we're getting in the weeds here, but 
Right. It, this is the same it's kind of the same, of, thing. The they, same they kind blow of mindset. Everything out of proportion. And this is one of those things too that is going to give it out to educators. Sure. And they know they can't discipline kids anymore because when you come in as a teacher now, and many people younger than I am and in my age, they say, "Oh, they don't tell the teachers that." Oh, absolutely, they do because when a new teacher comes in, they tell you, "Well, now, when the young person." If they're a young person, they say, okay, what am I supposed to do for discipline? And they will say, well, really, you can just send them to me because you really can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And people from my generation that haven't been in education, they go, oh, no, you're just you're exaggerating. No, I'm not. Right. I know people. And they will tell you, no, you got to be kidding about that. Say, no, they're telling the truth when they tell you that you mean surely you can make them stand in the corner no you can't No, you can't surely you can make them do exercises no you can't no i was in that uh, position and they wouldn't let me do that Uh, surely you can at least make them write sentences uh no you can't yeah it's re- it actually it, is against it, the rules. It is against the rules to do anything to a kid. I, you know, I hope somebody sees this and they'll say, oh, yes, you can. Okay, tell me what I can do. And that's what I want some of the people in education. And this is a symptom of what I was talking about the other day on one of the shows, and I've been talking about with people as to what is wrong with education. And the, the funding issue that came up with in Montgomery just recently, and there were a hundred and something teachers let go. And I got into some discussions online with different people. I said, that's not the fundamental problem. And of course, they automatically assumed that I was against taxes, against education, and I wanted those teachers fired. No, I didn't. I didn't want the teachers to go away. I I know how hard it is when you're overloaded with students. I know that as well as anyone does. I had the biggest room in the school. Well, and another thing. Guess where they put everybody when they didn't have anywhere to put them. I I know. I remember. But, (laughs) yeah, but, to your point, even you saying that doesn't mean that you're saying that the way that they handled it was correct. You were right. just saying that that's not the th- problem. It's not the core problem. The core problem is our system has gotten so far away from being able to have a student adult relationship that's proper mm-hmm. that will work. Right. Because now the child has the upper hand. Oh, absolutely. And and when the child has the upper upper hand in things, you're letting children and a grown man will allow a child to supersede his authority. I couldn't live like that. No, and and well, it's, well, you it's know, unfair to ask our teachers, many of whom are very dedicated, work very right. hard, spend even sometimes spend their own money, work long hours. Nobody here is saying that teachers don't have an incredibly difficult no, job. No, I'm a the problem is they're making teachers. It, they're making it more difficult than it needs to be. Absolutely, and the thing is, the victims are the kids. Ultimately, yes. See, I feel for the kids more than even the teachers because ultimately you're hurting the children mm-hmm. by doing it that way. Children, as we've often heard before, and it's even cliche, I would say, you know. Kids want to be disciplined. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want parameters. Well, that may be cliche, but it's true. They want an adult to be a leader over them. They really do. And I'm not talking about, a, you know, when someone brings up something and say, oh, he wants you to just beat children and abuse. I've never done that in my life. Never. You don't have to do that. I would I would be the first one that would stand in line to, to want to throw someone in jail that would hurt sure. a kid. Of course. Not talking about that, but you can discipline the kid without hurting them physically. Now, I believed in working their tails off, but that's good for them. You're not going to. We worry so much about we, we hear issues now about our children are just they're just lazy and they're they're not very physical and they're out of shape and their heart's not in good shape. They don't do anything and they won't let well, the teachers make them do anything. Let's, let's also think about it from this angle. A lot of people are complaining. That. Kids are having self-esteem issues. Right. And it's true. It is you, true. You look at it across the board. There are kids that have a, a, a dearth of meaning in their life. They don't feel a sense of purpose in a lot of uh, circumstances. Well, let's look at that and look at why that might be. If you have been told your entire life 
that you're so fragile mm -hmm. and incapable of doing something that you can't even pick weeds in a garden or do push-ups that mm -hmm. you're you're that fragile and you're that incompetent don't you think that affects someone's oh absolutely I, I believed in my philosophy in the classroom was this you break them down to build them up and it's the same philosophy that's used in the military it used to be right you break them down to build them up you're harsh on them to start with and you give them some confidence and they will gain confidence as you well, well know from personal experience, sure. I gave them opportunities Look, the, to, to build confidence. Absolutely. The reason that I'm here today, the reason I'm able to do a, a radio show and, and had a radio career and now do video podcasts, the reason I do that is because of the skills that I learned largely in your class. Right. And it, there are, I'm not the only one. There are other kids that have gone on to do other jobs in communication and, and jobs in completely different fields that are still using the things that were learned there because you made kids get up in front of and, and yet embarrass some kids. Of course it did. Over it. Right. And I used, I told the parents, I would say some of them would come to me. Sometimes another teacher would come to me. I'd say, look, ha have a little faith in me and be patient. They'll be fine. I never had a kid to explode into fire because I put them up in front of other people. Right. And if I could give them enough confidence in something like that, and they will grow in confidence. When you do something like that. And my point is this. See, now you're put into a position as an instructor that you're not allowed to do that if they have any trepidation at all about getting up in front of people, for example. Well, that's the thing. You're barely allowed to do that. Uh, do anything now with just normal kids. Imagine when you add this thing of ODD. Well, they, they have a disease. I think they it's too late. It. The statute of limitations has gone away now. I think I've been out long enough. I did it with all of them. I did it with special ed kids. I sure. did it with emotionally conflict kids. Didn't kill them. As a matter of fact, some of those kids probably gained more than anyone else did. Sure. They probably grew more. They probably gained more confidence than a lot of the, quote, normal kids, whatever a normal kid is. I don't know that I've ever run across a normal kid, to be honest, because they're all different anyway. Sure. Uh, every, every kid was unique. I believed in that with all my heart that it took different motivational strategies and eat. I learned each kid differently. They said, well, you need to treat them the same. That's the dumbest thing in the world to do. Treat all the kids the same, you treat them fairly, but you don't treat them the same. Right. But, but, but I, I, I had kids that, and back to the discipline part of it. Sure. This thing puts a kid into a position where they can't ever learn from mistakes. Mm-hmm. They can continue to do the same thing over and over again, and you can just write it off as oh that's that's just the disease. Yeah, that's, that's just that's a part of it, and there's nothing can be done about it. Because well, that kid will you, think that too. Exactly, and the thing is, if they think they can't fix it, then they won't. Right, and if I they think it, if they think they can't help it, that their bad behavior is just the side effect of whatever condition it is that they have, they will never work to correct it because they think that it can't be done. And it can be. You know, I've had young people to come up to me. They're grown now, 30, 35, 40 years old. And some of them that I still remember the names of, and the reason that I remember some names and don't remember some names is because the uh, the ones that gave me the most trouble, I remember their names. And the reason they, that I remember their names is because they stayed in trouble and I called their name a lot. <laughs> and as a result of that, they did a lot of push-ups and they did a lot of other things too. You know, I had kids that... And, and we're saying this on the air, and it, I don't know what kind of trouble it could get me into, but this was back then, and I guess it would have to change now if I were back in the classroom. But I had kids that did 100 push-ups every day. And they expected it if they did something wrong uh, because they were in pretty good shape. And I didn't make everybody do that many because everybody couldn't do that many. As a result of it, but those kids, first of all, all those kids that did so many, the first, I did a funeral a couple of weeks ago, as mm -hmm. you know. Right. One of your I students. don't remember a single one of those boys that didn't come up to me and say, I remember doing all those push-ups for you. <laughs> Every one of them said, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, he said, I wish teachers could do that now. I said, isn't that a shame? He said, I appreciate you making us do them. They did. Sure. Without exception, I didn't have a single kid, and I don't remember a single kid boy in there. I didn't make girls do push-ups. I didn't have a single boy in there 
come up to me and say, you were cruel to me. You shouldn't have made me do that. Not a single one. Mm. Because kids appreciate discipline. They do. I've never heard a kid really that didn't brag about a whipping they got. Now, sometimes it may take a little while. It may take a little right. insight to do it. But eventually, yes, they do yeah. appreciate that. Because later on, they think, you know, all he was trying to get me to do is act better. Yeah. I'm trying to put me in a position where I could learn something. I By wish the I way, had. To, yeah. to, to bring us kind of back to the, the discussion about the disease, I did want to share this because I yeah. think you'll you'll really appreciate <laughs> this one. Uh, the Mayo Clinic... When the, whenever they do one of these disease pages, wherever they they write down everything, they have a few categories that they always include. And one of them is causes, because they want to inform people about what causes the disease, that kind of thing, mostly to help prevention. Here was what they had under causes for this one. Yes. There's no known clear cause of oppositional defiant disorder. Contributing causes may be a combination of inherited and environmental factors, including genetics... A child's natural disposition or temperament and possibly neurobiological differences in the way that nerves and the brain function. And environment. Problems with parenting that may invoke a lack of supervision, inconsistent or harsh discipline, or abuse or neglect. Do you okay, so the causes ahead. are either genetics mm -hmm. environment. or environment. Right. What else is there? There isn't anything else, and that's, that's the problem with that. Literally anything could cause this. Sure. They, and they've made it such a broad, sweeping thing that it could affect literally anybody, and they're saying, well, the cause could be anything. We have no idea. Right. And and you can take any child. I don't care who it is. Any grown-up. I don't care who it is. You can say their problem is either genetic or from their environment. Right. Because you can blame anything on that or give praise for anything on that. I mean, that could one be one or the other. That's the thing. That could be true of, of literally anything. That could be true of uh, a sunburn or somebody being so psychotic that they kill six million people. Yeah. If either one of those two things, it, it falls into that category right. in some way. Adolf Hitler. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. th it could be literally anything. Right. Or it could be the best kid in the history of mankind. Either way. And right. of course, your genetics have enough impact on you and your environment so. has an impact on you it's how you relate you can't help your genetics once you're born right all you can but, do is learn how to react to the environment that you're in but what's going on here is that they have made the conditions for creating this disease in somebody so incredibly vague that it's meaningless and, and that's one thing that i tell people not that i'm an expert in law but i tell people the same thing about laws and bills that we're talking about if you're passing a law or a bill that is so vague that it's worthless, yeah. then it's not a good law. It's not. And, and it's the same thing here. If you're creating the parameters of how to prevent a disease, and it is so broad that it's like, well, it could literally be anything, well, then what's the point of writing it down? What's the point of diagnosing it in the first place? Well, people have wondered why I've made such a big deal out of this. Sure. And I've texted it to people. I've put it on Facebook and those kind of things. Is First of all, it points out how stupid we are in education a lot of times. And, but it's certainly a symptom in our society of how wrong we are with regard to our young people. Mm. We are failing them because of things. And, and, and some, someone that's uh, in education would say, we're just trying to help them. You're making them weak. <laughs> You're, I, I know uh, one of your favorite. Reminds me of, remember, remember the Titans. I mean, you that's just, hilarious. You, I was literally about yeah, to bring that up. You, you're making them weak because of that. Denzel needs to do a speech about this. <laughs> I, that would be outstanding. We need to get Denzel Washington up. <laughs> yeah, that here. would be good. And and he could too. And and when he was talking about it, oh, you dropped my football. <laughs> and I think about things like that. Oh, I can do that speech. And, you from know, memory. and Petey didn't drop the football anymore either. No. Or at least did his best not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. And and so it's the same kind of things we can't correct our kids when they mess up. And but when somebody acts a fool you got to be able to rein them in. But but what's the difference that you just brought up in that analogy? Is that the teacher in that scenario, the character, of course, and I know it's a movie, but it, it's a good analogy. But he was a real coach, he too. Is, yeah, Herman, was a, that Herman was a true Boone story. Is, Herman yeah. Boone is a real person. Still living, in fact, yes. Uh, but it, in fact, uh, John and Barry on our sister station did an interview with him one time. Yes, I they did. That. Mm -hmm. But the thing, about, uh, the thing about that story is, he knew that the kids could be better than they were, and he expected them to rise to that potential. You know, and at the end of, the, of that, 
they did. And listen, you go to the end of that show or that movie. Right. Look at the end of the movie, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of those kids turned out really well, didn't they? Ministers, educators, policemen. Right, and that part of the movie is based on right. the real life. That, that's actually what yeah. happened. That's yeah. just what happened with those main characters. Mm -hmm. And it's true in life, too, because we're all going to have to overcome things, and it's just overcoming anger. You better overcome anger because we're deceiving kids when we tell them when they're young it's okay to be that way because when they get into the world, they're not going to be able to keep a job well, because you can't thing. be defiant – when the boss tells you to do something. Right. You cuss you out either, your boss. He's not going to care you that do you have it. ODD. <laughs> right. You do it or he'll find somebody else to do your job. Right. And then if you get so defiant and you get physical, he will have your hind end arrested and you'll be in jail. I mean, that's the way, that's the natural progression of this thing. Well, that's one of the things that I've said for a really long time. And any time that I talk about this, I, I know that there are people, especially educrats, that their heads explode when I say this. I've always said embarrassment is a largely underutilized. Oh, absolutely. Tool. I and used the, it. Right. You but, cut my legs out from under me if I couldn't use some embarrassment. But the reason I, I say that and the reason that I believe it is because, and I've always tried to frame it this way. Would you rather the kid be embarrassed in a school in front of a teacher and a bunch of kids or would you rather him be embarrassed when he's 25 or 30 year, years old and he's got a family to feed mm -hmm. and he might lose his job because of it? You embarrass them while they're kids where they can take it, where they're in a controlled environment, and then they're a lot tougher and can handle it a lot better when it actually counts out in the real world. It is. Time after time they came to me. With regard to the embarrassment, I'll share this real quick. I had a sure. kid that I had spit to get up and do a speaking part. Mm-hmm. And that kid, for three weeks in a row, just lost it every time. And he, he was a 14-year-old kid, and he cried when he had to do it. And I finally had had it to the top of my head. And some of the girls in there felt sorry for him. And they said, Mr. Cogwood, stop making him do that. I said, it's just upsetting him too much. He just can't do it. And I said, oh, yeah, he can. Finally, the fourth week, I think it was, I broke down. and said, all right, this is it. This is the last time we're doing this. I said, get your tail up there and finish it. I said, I know you know what it is. Finish it. I said, I don't care if it takes the rest of the day. I said, if we don't do anything else today, you're going to do this. I said, now get your tail up there and do it. Mm -hmm. They said, Mr. Conkwood. I said, no, we're going to finish this. This, I'm. You are not leaving this room until you do it. I said, I don't care if we have to stay here all day. I said, I'll keep you out of your other classes. I dug in. And when that kid did it and he finished it that first day, he got as loud of an ov ovation as anybody has ever gotten in my class, including with me. Mm -hmm. I clapped for him, too. The next week, he did it just like everybody else did. A couple of weeks later, he came out of his shell and I ended up having to make him do push-ups because he was talking too much. That <laughs> you is the created a monster. <laughs> I created a monster. Absolutely, that is the gospel truth about that kid. <laughs> that kid came out of his shell, and you might have gotten in trouble a little bit more, but isn't that better than being so reserved he's even scared to ask a question or scared to talk to a girl? Sure. He got to the point he was sort of aggressive, you know, and asking, he was uh, flirting with girls and stuff. Made a difference in that kid's life. I won't say his name. Some of the kids that saw this, they'd know exactly what I was talking about. He was in the ninth grade. He was 14, 15 years old. And that's one of those things they have to over. They talk about comfort zone all the time. And then sometimes when we make them come out of the comfort zone, then they pitch a fit about it. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It reminds me of something that I was reading from Jonathan Hyatt uh, a while back. And one of the things that he points out, and I thought that it was really profound, as he said, there used to be, especially in America, just because it was kind of our culture and we had sort of the cowboy frontier kind of mentality, that we always believed that whatever didn't kill you makes you stronger. Oh, absolutely. He said, in recent years, he's observed, and this guy's a psychologist, mm -hmm. um, he said, in recent years, I've observed, especially in young people, a growing mentality that whatever makes uh, whatever doesn't kill you makes you weaker. 
In other words, when you're faced with some kind of obstacle or mm -hmm. you're faced with something that's difficult for you to overcome, the immediate reaction by especially a lot of younger people now is to shrink away from it and try to find a way around it instead yeah. of enduring. And used to, Americans were kind of known for being the cowboys that did things that were really difficult, and and we've lost a lot of that sort of pioneer spirit, and he, uh, he attributes a lot of our nation's problems specifically to that. That's the reason that we have, we were just talking with Becky Gerritsen the other day about the safe space thing with college campuses, where they think that there's, there's places they need to be protected yeah. from ideas that make them uncomfortable. That's embarrassing to it be is. in a safe place. I mean, I understand having a safe place if somebody's going to attack you physically, but because something didn't oh, yeah, well, go I, your way politically or something, I mean, good grief. Well, this person is saying things that makes me feel uncomfortable. I need to be freed from that. That doesn't make any sense. I say grow up. And well, let me say this about the embarrassment from a while ago. Sure. And and I was the same way. It doesn't make any difference about the what it was. You know this. I didn't embarrass one kid. I embarrassed them all. Some weren't embarrassed necessarily because some of them were completely comfortable in doing some of the things I had them to do. Well, and I would but, say that I was more in that camp. Oh, yeah, on that absolutely. Stuff. But you did embarrass me. You had to do it different ways. I but did, you did it. Embarrass me. I did it with all of them. I mean, I was clean cut across the board. And that's why it worked because in that situation, everybody expected it. Right. You weren't singling anybody. No, I didn't out. single anybody. I loved all of them, wanted them all to do well. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it turned out. And I, you know, getting back to this, this defiance disorder. Sure. I hope somebody has their grown up drawers on and can recognize this for what it is and pull funding on it and say, look, this is, this is closely akin to the drama that we have with climate change. Yeah. Well, it's well, the same kind of junk. Well, that goes back to what I was saying. I think that this thing is mostly garbage, but. Yeah, but, but it see it's garbage with teeth in it though. It's garbage I know with it funding. Is. It's garbage with with lawsuits behind right, it. Right, and I understand that, but I'm just kind of going to the the larger point here. Right. Uh regardless of the actual practical application. I think that this is mostly garbage, but the point is there are kids that tend to be more defiant, have more anger. That uh -huh. happens occasionally, but what bothers me about having this categorized as some kind of disease that you could diagnose just about any teenager in existence right now with, the the problem that they're doing this is it goes back to what I was just saying with Jonathan Hyatt. It is an excuse to avoid overcoming your own shortcomings. Right. And let me tell you how it's going to affect people in education. This is going to, to come out mm -hmm. in summer programs. In workshops, you're going to have special ed teachers that are going to be doing instruction to the staff mm. about this and how to handle it and how we need to back off of what we do when kids get defiant and those kind of things is going to weaken the whole school. Yeah. I, I guarantee you, I promise you. Which is really and, and troubling going be, considering how we're already. And, right, we are. And also, and the principal, uh, right on cue, he's going to get up and say, you know, we got to uh, we'll have to document, make sure that we back ourselves up so we don't get in trouble with the law. And and uh, most in services were where fear tactics were used to scare teachers from doing things. That's you, primary focus of a lot of what not all of it, but a lot of what we did at the beginning of the year was scare tactics against the teachers. Sounds almost like you've done this before. Yeah, I have. And I've, I saw it over and over again. And I. You know, I'd whisper to one of the teachers and I'd say, here it comes again. You know, we're going to be the the beauty of it was from my vantage point is I knew I didn't have anything for anybody to get anyway. Right. I could lose my job, but they couldn't take much from me because it didn't have a whole lot anyway. Can't get and blood I think from that's, a stone. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess that's how I think that's how people would, uh, you know, with the discipline, if we could use some good, wholesome discipline across the board, we could fix our schools in our state, I don't know what, you, you'd have to blow up Montgomery's system, not the people, but the, you'd have to start yeah, over I know in Montgomery. You you'd have to start over in Montgomery just about it to to make any headway down here because it's just such a lost cause at this point, and they're not going to do anything to anybody down here, and they'll all talk about it, and they'll talk to death, but they just won't do anything. Uh, and I would love for someone to say and, and point out how I'm wrong with that. 
because the school system here is just a disaster. And well, and that's and, the problem and, and you're running into. And they're not using discipline down here at all. And people avoid this place like the plague. As soon as they get the other job opportunity in the river region outside of this county in Montgomery, they will go somewhere else. Or a and whole they, bunch of them will work in Montgomery, but live somewhere else so that they have better schools. Yeah. That I mean, happens it, a lot too. Yeah. They just, it's, uh, it's a shame down here. And that's an example. Montgomery is a wonderful example of how taking discipline out of the school, what happens to it. Mm -hmm. The good people avoid it. The others are still there. And it's sad because they can, they're smart kids there too that are being lost. They're talented kids in this system that are being lost and the grown people aren't doing anything about it. Well, and like you said earlier, it's really the kids that are the ones suffering right. the most because the teachers, they'll be fine. They'll still get their paycheck ultimately, even if their job's harder. Mm -hmm. But the kids, they don't get those years back. No, they don't. And I'm hoping that people will recognize this is a, a, an, a symptom of something that's greater. And I think most people just put education out of their mind when their kids are out of it. They're concerned about it then. They've already been through it themselves. If they get away from it, any distance from and, it, and they I can don't tell worry you, about I'm, it. I'm guilty of that because yeah. I don't have any kids. I don't have anybody in the system. And so well, I don't it, think about it on a day-to-day -day It bugs basis. me because I dedicated my life to young people. Sure. It, it's glaring to me when something like this happens. And I already see the outgrowth of some of the things that have transpired. So. All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us, John from Millbrook. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.